Um, I think we'll get started. Good evening. Um, I'm Dr. Joseph Schumann. I'm a leader of the New York Society for Ethical Culture, and I'd like to extend to all of you a very warm welcome. It's so good to see you all here. Um, we are in for a very exciting experience this evening, uh, an exchange of important and vital ideas between two guests who have actually been here before, but I don't think really have engaged each other at the New York Society. So this is not a first in terms of their presence, but it's a first in terms of their uh, conversation with one another. Uh, let me just say, for those of you who are not familiar with the New York Society, uh, we're we were founded in 1876 as a humanistic congregation committed to a respect for um, the highest ideals of truth, uh, justice, peace, and social cooperation. Uh, but we are not merely an intellectual organization, although ideas are really central and vital to what we are about. What we'd like to do is try to take the ideas that we stand for and put them into concrete action action for the sake of uh, moving American society ahead in a progressive direction. And so much of the history of the New York Ethical Society has been its illustrious history in terms of building uh, social justice and social service institutions, uh, many of them founded many years ago and many of them still very vital today. Um, there's a great deal going on at the New York Society. We are a very program-rich program humanistic group. Uh, we have cultural activities, play reading groups, uh, literature groups. We have opportunities for social action. And tonight, as you'll see, we have the opportunity to engage in um, important and enlivening conversation. Um, committed to democracy as we are, we believe that the exchange of ideas is really vital to the maintenance of democracy. And so today, this evening's program is very much in our spirit and fulfills our purposes. Um, let me introduce our two guests. Um, the first to my immediate right is Dr. Massimo Piliucci. Uh, Dr. Piliucci is Professor of Ecology and Evolution at the State University of New York uh, in Stony Brook. His research revolves around the evolution of genotype environment interactions. Okay, how many people can tell me what that's about? <laughs> There you go. <laughs> In ethical culture, everyone's unique, so there you go. Uh, Massimo received, uh, actually Massimo comes to us with two PhDs. Uh, his first is a doctorate in genetics uh, from the University of Ferrara in Italy, um, and he has a PhD uh, in botany uh, from, oh, excuse me, uh, and his PhD is in botany from the University of Connecticut. Uh, he also holds a PhD in philosophy from the University of Tennessee. Um, he is a prolific writer and a noted skeptic. He's published in national magazines such as Free Inquiry, The Skeptical Inquirer, Philosophy Now, and Secular Nation. He is very much uh, invested and identified with the secular and rationalist movements and is willing to publicly take on both uh, theists as well as advocates of creationism, and I'm sure he wins all those debates. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. And they're very mild matter of discussions, by the way. Um, to my far right is Susan Jacoby. Susan is Metaphoric. a... What? Metaphoric. <laughs> <laughs> Susan uh, is a very noted American writer. I see her name in the New York Times frequently, both in the book review and on the op-ed page. Um, she uh, has written on many different uh, themes, uh, many of them American-based. Uh, let me just mention a few of them. Um, she's written a book uh, called Free Thinkers, A History of American Secularism. And actually, I was privileged to interview Susan on that book after it came out in <coughs> Teaneck, New Jersey. I'm not sure she remembers I it. Do. I'm glad you do remember. It was quite a while ago. Yeah, she's also wrote a book called The Age of American Unreason. Um, and I interviewed Susan here not long ago on her marvelous book called Never Say Die, The Myth and Marketing of the New Old. Um, tonight, what we're going to be doing is uh, holding an interview. And Massimo Piliucci will be interviewing Susan 
on her latest book, it just came out, it's called The Great Agnostic, Robert Ingersoll and American Free Thought. After they're finished, let me tell you how this is going to work. Uh, Massimo will be engaged in conversation with Susan for about 45 minutes and then we'll open up, uh, open up the conversation to the floor for any questions that you may have for about a half an hour and then we'll close the evening. But uh, before you leave, what I want everyone to do is to queue up at the book table. <laughs> Make sure you buy a copy of both books, okay? We don't, we don't want to play favorites. And I'm sure... We'll close uh, the doors. And what, we'll close the doors, doors right? Doors. There we go. Right, right. Uh, we'll close the doors, won't let you out until you uh, pull out your wallets and purchase the books. But I'm sure in return, both Susan and Massimo would be happy to autograph the books for you. Without further ado, let's extend a very warm welcome to Massimo Pugliucci. <laughs> Thanks very much. That was yeah, a nice pleasure. introduction. So um, let's get uh, right to it. And the first question is going to be an easy one. Okay. Not that the next. Soft. Yeah, that's right. A little softball first. So, so uh, I guess it's the obvious, obvious one. Why Ingersoll? What was your aim? What was your, what your goal with this particular book? My goal is the same, on obviously a somewhat less elevated level, as Ingersoll's was for Thomas Paine in the 19th century which is to reintroduce him, to the extent that it's possible, to a new generation of people and place his importance in American secular history, which he did. It's almost impossible to think now of Thomas Paine being forgotten, but he almost was by the last quarter of the 19th century. Ingersoll made it one of his missions to reintroduce Paine to his countrymen for whom he had done so much during the Revolution. And, and I wanted to do this, and also, there are a number of good biographies of Ingersoll written earlier in the 20th century, but they're, in a way, they're not up to date. They're each of them, whether from the perspective of the 1920s or the 1970s, they're from the perspective of that day. And I, and I wanted to, because the Yale University Press has a 40,000 word limit for these biographies, I wanted to look at Ingersoll in terms of what he has to say in terms of the cultural issues, whether they involve the roles of men and women or the role of science, uh, evolution, today uh, in contrast and in comparison to the same issues which were very fiercely debated in Ingersoll's time and he was one of the most fierce debaters. So in, in effect I wanted to bring him up to date. So now you, you, you do start the book by asking the question of why is it that some people that are famous in their own time uh, become in, you know, sort of embedded in, the, in the, the, the cultural consciousness and others just go away, become forgotten. And Inge so clearly almost did the second, the second part. Now, why is it, what, what, uh, what happened? Well, there's a, it's, Ingersoll is hardly the only person this, is, right. this has happened to. And indeed, as I pointed out, Thomas Paine, because he was, a, at the turn of the 19th century, of the 18th century, Thomas Paine, of course, was one of the most famous people in America for having written the crisis pa papers during the Revolutionary War. But while, while he was visiting England and France, he wrote this little book called The Age of Reason, which put forth the astonishing idea that the Bible was written by men and not by God. And this really had, has a long influence on the eclipse of his reputation even as the Revolutionary War writer today. Uh, there are a lot of reasons. Uh, so one of them is simply that your ideas become unpopular and there's no one around, the cycle hasn't run around <coughs> so they become popular again. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, whom I'm sure everyone knows is one of the founding mothers of the women's rights movement today, was barely known from about 1910 until the revival of feminism in the 1970s. And actually there was a reason for that too. She was very distanced from the mainstream suffragist movement because she wrote a book called The Woman's Bible, which basically said that, 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 that religion was the major source of women's subjugation in society. Again, not, not a popular thing. So that there's some things that are cyclical, but, and they're intellectual fashions, but people whose memories are forgotten 
they tend to be people who were part of movements that have been allowed to be forgotten until movements arise again, as, as, they, as they frequently, but not always do. I mean, I, I'm very conscious of this right now because I've been reading about someone, I, I've been reading about all of the various schisms within early Christianity, all of the roads Christianity could have taken, like, like the philosopher Pelagius, uh, who uh, basically didn't believe in the Trinity, and he didn't believe in the excuses for free will of God that Augustine, his contemporary, was offering. And uh, nobody remembers who Pelagius is today, well, except, probably, except probably philosophers. And yet, a lot, of, a lot of those people, their ideas become incorporated, but they aren't, they aren't given credit for it. <laughs> now, sometimes, of course, being forgotten is a good thing. I mean, I'm hoping that Deepak Chopra is going <laughs> 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 to... I, I wonder why. Yeah. <laughs> and then there's Dinesh D'Souza. I can yeah, yeah, a whole lot of people well, I hope there's, there's a good number. <laughs> now, talking about things that I've uh, had at each and have, have sort of gone away and hopefully they may return. Uh, now, Ingress, of course, was, was um, part of what some people term uh, the golden age of free thought. Well, that also ended at some point. Um, and the question is, the, the two questions are why? And, and second, uh, do you think that we will see that again? Are we, are we seeing that again already? or? or Oh, what? boy, isn't, isn't that a big question? <laughs> well, I mean, the golden age of free thought, I mean, obviously it didn't mean that, that Americans turned in, uh, the majority of Americans turned away from religion and toward agnosticism and atheism. And by the way, Ingersoll wasn't having any distinctions between agnostics and atheists. When he was interviewed about this, and he was asked, uh, he was called the great agnostic, but that's not what he called himself, that's what people called him, because the word had just been invented by Thomas Henry Huxley, largely because it sounded less abrasive than atheist, as it does today, and atheist is a much older word. Uh, so Ingersoll, uh, I'm sorry. What was the what was the well, part? Sorry, the, the, free, the, the, the golden age of free. Yeah. Oh, so right. so I think it was it was an age when because of Darwin's theory of evolution mainly, a split begins, and this is in a way it's why it was able to be a golden age of free thought. There's a huge split in American Protestantism, and a huge split in Judaism. Also, a much smaller group of people, of course, of which ethical culture is an offshoot between people who accommodated their religion to secular knowledge, uh, who became the mainstream and liberal Protestant denominations, and, uh, and let us say Reformed Judaism, I would say as well, and people who said no, who became largely fundamentalist Protestants. Catholics didn't exactly count yet then in the American mix, although they, in terms of the philosophical arguments, Catholics took very little part in the debate within Protestantism and Judaism because, after all, they had a pope who was even more bent on infallibility. You know, when Pius IX came in and got the doctrine of papal infallibility declared, so Catholic, the Catholic Church wasn't ready for the debate it would later have in, in the 20th century on the same issues. So one of the things Ingersoll did is he had lots of friends who were liberal Protestants, and he felt that every Every Protestant church that accommodated itself to secular knowledge, or tried to, he felt that this was a victory for free thought, that, that it weakened the, the influence of religion in general. Uh, what he didn't realize was, and he thought, of course, as all free thinkers of his generation did, that, that we would still be talking about fundamentalism and a literal interpretation of the Bible today, he, they all thought that this was simply going to die out, that, it would, that, the, that these same issues he was talking about then would, would be around today. So it's called the golden age of free thought, not because free thought converted America, but because there was this big attempt to accommodate secular knowledge, whether it resulted in real free thought as we probably would define it today, or whether it simply resulted in a liberalization of certain kinds of religion. I think that I, I would I'll go on a little later to answer your question about are we having another golden age of free thought mm -hmm. today. Uh, let's wait for that. Okay. Maybe, maybe we I'll, can wind up with I'll, that. I'll one. get back on yeah. to that one. I mean, but you're right, of course, 
just just because there is a label such such as the golden age of uh, of reason. I mean, in Europe there was the Enlightenment. That doesn't mean that every European was rational, right? Right. And, you know, and got into and got a copy of the right. encyclopedia. So. Um, that's, um, we'll get back however, at, uh, to, to where we are now because I have a couple of other questions related to that. Now, um, you mentioned that um, Ingersoll had no trouble switching back and forth between the labels atheist and agnostic. And, it, and it, you're right, that the, the, the term agnostic had just been introduced by Huxley um, in, uh, in it, was part. it was introduced not for philosophical purposes. No, but for very practical. For PR purposes. Right, for PR purposes, yeah. you know, actually was known as, as uh, became known eventually as uh, Darwin's bulldog because of his very aggressive uh, way of defending the women uh, theories. But yes, so that as, was, as indeed the late the late Pope Benedict XVI was known as God's bulldog. There you go. <laughs> oh, I did not know that. Yeah. Yeah. They called him. They called him when he was the head of the. Of the, of the society of the society for the, for the faith, which was formerly called the Office of the Inquisition, they called it God God's bulldog. Now, in a little bit before, I, I'm going to ask you a question now, but, but later we're going to also get to how is it that we went from Darwin's bulldog to Darwin's Rottweiler? <laughs> that is one of the nicknames that Dawkins got. But um, so back to these agnostic atheist thing. These days, at least in the in the free thought community um, here in the United States. On the other hand, there is a big deal of a debate about what exactly is an atheist, who counts as an atheist, what is the difference between atheist and agnostic. So what, what's your opinion <coughs> on that? Should All right, and I, know, and, I, and I know I see you. I know there are people in this room who will disagree with me. Of course, there are people, there are people who are like the deists of the, 19th, of the 18th century, like the founding fathers, who really, who really may, don't believe in a traditional God but do believe in some kind of a guiding providence. And I would say that that was true of most of, of the founders. They were not atheists in the sense that, that we talk of an atheist today. But I also think, and I've written this, and probably most of you saw my piece after Newtown in the New York Times about this, I think that there is still a great fear on the part of people who are atheists to say I'm an atheist because it still has a harsher, more abrasive sound. And I also think that even people in the secular community have a mistaken idea of what atheist means. And I think this was Ingersoll's great point when he was asked. He said, the atheist doesn't say, I know there is not a God, because you can't prove a negative. Uh, and to me, that says it all. In other words, I can't tell you, I know there is not a God. All the atheist says to me is what most people who call themselves agnostics have said to me, which is, is that given the available evidence before me, I don't think so. I, I'm going to order my life on the basis of what I see as the evidence of the natural world. And if the supernatural comes along, well, we'll see about then. I mean, I've always said, Ingersoll used to say this too, bring me somebody I know who died yesterday and who's risen from the grave, and I'll reconsider it. And, and I've, always said, I've always said the same thing to people. Bring me the people I love who have died in the last five years. Tell me you're going to bring them to my house tonight, and I'm going to make us all spaghetti carbonara, and we'll have a great time. And so I will reconsider my position on the existence of God. But I think a lot of people who are reluctant to call themselves atheists are not only reluctant to do so because it's a bad word in American culture, but also because they think incorrectly that an atheist like me says, I know there's no God, and that would be ridiculous, as any philosopher knows. Now, following up on that one, however, um, there is a discussion just very recently. Um, I, I read the, the, the latest outburst about this just yesterday. Um, about, again, within the atheist community, um, for instance, there are some people who claim that, well, atheist isn't just about either denying or making statement, you know, a epistemic statement, as philosophers would put it, about the existence or non-existence of God. It's, it's much broader, uh, some people call it atheism plus, some people use other names, but anyway, it implies a certain outlook on society and politics and so on and so forth. I honestly don't find that argument compelling at all, but what's your take on about, so what, what, other, what other things uh, I want, is one I, don't, I don't either. I, I would say that the word humanism, and many humanists are atheists, does, does imply a broader outlook, which is also a political outlook. But it is absolutely not true that atheism, I'm sure a lot of Americans would say that atheists are all political liberals. It is absolutely not true. As I wrote in this book, 
And as I think Ingersoll's life proves, I think there are two distinct strands of atheism. One of them, and, and secularism also, one of them derives from the radical humanism of Thomas Paine, and Ingersoll is a part of that line. And the other derives from the social Darwinists of the 19th century, many of whom were Ingersoll's friends, but whom he parted company with, who believed that, uh, that man in a state of civilization, that natural selection applied to man in a state of civilization, as well as man in a state of nature. And some were inherently superior, uh, races, classes of people. The poor were poor because they deserved to be poor. The social Darwinists believed that. Ingersoll absolutely did not. And I think that strand of social Darwinism comes in the 20th century through Ayn Rand. And uh, the only problem for the right-wing Christians in the Republican Party today is they have to, they love Ayn Rand, but she was an atheist, and they, they have to blur that. But I, 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 I completely agree with you that being an atheist does not necessarily imply one political outlook. <clears throat> being a humanist does, I, I would say. Right. I but being an atheist does not. I mean, there's a huge difference, but, but apparently, uh, according to Peter. For example, there are lots of atheists who believe that women are less intelligent inherently than men. I saw them. One of the Wait, that's not true. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> One of the reasons I stopped writing my spirited atheist column for the Washington Post, which has no editing of comments, which I think is a terrible thing, and and I won't write for internet publications anymore that have no that don't require people to register as themselves before they make comments. But certainly, a lot of the comments on my blog were resentment from male atheists that a woman was writing the column. And it showed in many ways, and they all they were all talking, they all sounded like Paul Ryan except for God. Um, and they all they, they, they were they were all obsessed with how, as as is well known, they would say, and said, You're you're a typical sentimental woman denying the un incontrovertible evidence that blacks are stupider than whites and whites are stupider than Asians. And, you know, and, and there were so many of these, and they would call me, and then, they, and then on faith, posed the question to all of their columnists, why are women more religious than men? And of course, these guys came in overwhelmingly. It's obvious women are stupider than men. Oh, OK. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I stopped writing this column because I thought, I don't want to be providing a forum for these anonymous people who, you know, who hide behind no names and say this crap. So let's, let's, let me go back again to... Ingersoll. Um, well, eventually I actually will go back to Ingersoll, but I'm, I'm fascinated by this distinction that I think you're right in making uh, between these, two, at least these two major branches, uh, historical branches of free thought or atheism uh, in the United States. And um, that, that to me seems to be making the point very clearly that in fact there is no logical commitment uh, that an atheist has to to go for a particular uh, political doctrine or a political philosophical position. And if you compare in Rand, as I said, with, with Thomas yeah. Paine, they're just saying yeah, I, I think that's true. Other, yeah. right? But they're both atheists, um, and, uh, and so very, very clearly so. Um, so we, we agree that actually, so P.C. Meyer says that the two of us apparently, he doesn't mention us by name, but um, yeah, yeah, yeah. but apparently <laughs> we're, we're a little um, uh, silly and naive for, for thinking that there is no political dimension to it. I, I, I think I agree completely with you that it's, the term there is humanism, not... Yeah, you know, there, there, are, there are issues <laughs> dimensions to atheism sure. uh, in terms of that, that in general, I mean, atheists obviously have a different attitude towards science than non-atheists, sure. but, but so do humanists. But, but a kind of, uh, I think that when you say when you say things like that about atheism, and Ingersoll was totally against that. And, and I have this book up here because you have to the the very basis of the scientific method has to be that science is always open to new evidence. In science, you never say never. New evidence uh, can overturn any previously thought thing in science. It's the scientific method that remains constant. And Ingersoll really got it in, in 1891 when he came out against vivisection, which was really the precursor of the modern animal rights movement. 
And a lot of his friends, like Spencer and a number of scientists, said he was betraying a sentimentality when he said that animals could feel pain. And, and Ingersoll's reply to that, which he didn't write down, was, was apparently these people had never stepped on a dog's paw, paw and heard him howl if they, uh, if they don't believe animals can feel pain. But I just want to read you one paragraph. This is one of the reasons I consider him a great man, because he never allowed, he never allowed the fact that he agreed with people in general to make him agree with them specifically about everything. And because th there was a lot more vivisection in the 19th century is why the anti-vivisectionist movement grew up. And here's what Ingersoll said, and I think what's important about this is 1891. Uh, he said, we can excuse in part the crimes of passion. We take into consideration the fact that man is liable to be caught by the whirlwind and that from a brain on fire a soul rushes to crime. But what excuse can ingenuity form for a man who deliberately and with an unaccelerated pulse, with the calmness of John Calvin at the murder of Servatius, seeks with curious and cunning knives in the living, quivering flesh of a dog for all of the throbbing nerves of pain. Now listen to this. The wretches who commit these infamous crimes pretend that they are working for the good of man and that their pity for the sufferings of the human race drives out all pity for the animals they slowly torture to death. But those who are incapable of pitying animals are, as a matter of fact, incapable of pitying men. A physician who would cut a living rabbit in pieces would not hesitate to try experiments with men and women for the gratification of his curiosity. Fifty years before Dr. Mengele, one of the reasons this man is one of my heroes is he was right about so many things ahead of the worst demonstrations of them that were yet to come. So basically, he was... And he was right on the basis of what he saw. So basically, he was a sentimental woman. Really. Yeah, <laughs> basically. And he was, he was a feminist, too. And, 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 and that, was, that was very important because he agreed with Elizabeth Cady Stanton that the vote alone was not going to guarantee, he said, before there were any reliable means of contraception. Again, you know, consider the issues, the cultural issues that are still hot today. He said, a woman will never be mistress of herself until she is able to control the size of her family. So Ingersoll was ahead of his time in, on a variety of issues, like, including feminism. Um, is it fair to say that he was ahead even of the current atheist movement? That is, another way to phrase the question is, do you think that the, the modern atheist movement has a, a feminism or misogynistic even problem? Well, I don't, I don't, it's interesting. Somebody asked that to me in another context today. And here comes shameless salesmanship. Sure. I have a, a, a brand new ebook out, which was just published yesterday by Random House, only $2.99. It's called, it's called, for those of you with Kindle, it's called The Last Men on Top. And it's about my father's generation. It's about it's about the it's about the war generation and about how Mad Men is really about the one percent uh, and the, the fact is is that most working men of the World War II generation did not live the way they are they are portrayed there. But so I was talking with somebody about who was interviewing me about this ebook today, and he asked this, this brought up the same issue you did. Uh, well, he he brought it up in a, in, in, a, in a reverse way. He said, because there's discussion about misogyny in the secular movement, aren't secularists maybe, you know, isn't there the same thing at Methodist church meeting, and aren't secularists being held to a different standard? And I haven't been to too many, you know, Methodist revival reading, meetings lately, so I can't tell about them. But I would say that certainly secular humanists, given the values most of us claim, and one of them is not the value that women are stupider than men, Given the values we claim, we ought to be held to and hold ourselves to a higher standard on these matters. So, while I, I am not surprised to find Pope Francis renewing his contempt for American nuns, uh, if I hear the same contempt at a secular or an atheist meeting, uh, I do believe that secular humanists and atheists who claim to be animated by reason ought to hold themselves to a higher standard 
than uh, Pope Francis does. And we know what the record of, of the popes is about women. That's a pretty uh, low standard, yeah. <laughs> no, no, but, uh, no, but what I mean is I don't think comparing, uh, in other words, I don't think there's any more of a misogyny problem in the secular movement today than there was 100 years ago. But there ought to be a lot less of one because we are, we are, we are a lot farther along. And there was plenty of misogyny among free thinkers back then, too. But let me push it just a little bit on this before we go back to the results. So, we just you, you just said a minute ago that um, we, we agreed that that being an atheist doesn't commit you to any particular uh, political or philosophical positions beyond beyond what you're saying about God. So, I, I would expect say that. Lead. Okay. <laughs> I, okay. I, so then elaborate because I would expect. I don't. I don't. I don't think that, that. I don't think that thinking women have. As, as uh, women have the intellectual capacity of men, it's a political position. No. So I, mean, I think, I think, in other words, being an atheist commits you to reason. <laughs> okay. Sure. We can, we can, we can and, go that way. And, uh, and, and, and I would say that I would say that the belief that uh, that women are inherently less intelligent than men, it's and blacks are inherently less intelligent than whites. I understand there are arguments made on the basis of reason to the contrary, but uh, but I but I do think. Uh, I do think, of course, Ayn Rand thought all women except her were stupider than men. Yeah. <laughs> uh, somehow that doesn't surprise me. Um, she did. Yeah. I, but then, I, but then Ayn Rand, who hated the government, collected her social security too, which when she got to be old enough. <laughs> okay. That doesn't surprise me. Okay, back to Ingersoll. Um, so you mentioned the issue of vivisection and uh, his objection to it, which was ahead of his time. Uh, and so on. So, in other words, so part of what you said a minute ago was also that he was not afraid of criticizing uh, even his some, friends. Yeah, his friends, yeah. people who worked with him. And in particular, he was not uh, uh, afraid of criticizing you know, certain aspects of science, in mm -hmm. the, the specific example of the exception. I, on, I, on the other hand, have the, 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 the um, uh, sort of uh, feeling. He didn't that, consider the vivisection science. No, right. It's pseudoscience. That's right. Pseudoscience, fine. But but if it is, but if it's something that is practiced by you know a number of, of people who consider themselves mainstream scientists, you're still criticizing science, right? even though you're criticizing no. it by. Oh, uh, absol absolutely not. Okay. You are holding science up to its own standards and saying that a man that that, a, that a, someone who calls himself a scientist and says that a dog can't feel pain is not looking at the evidence. It's a bad scientist. Not a, he's a bad scientist. Right. Yeah. Agreed. Now, where I was going with this was, however, that on the other hand, my feeling um, uh, over the last few years is that there is quite the opposite attitude in the um, skeptic and, and very likely the atheist uh, movement contemporary, which is there's almost a uncritical embrace of whatever it is that, that goes under the rubric of science. There is some level of scientism that I, that I um, detect. Do you think that's the case? Uh, how do we get here from, from something much more reasonable? It, it, depends, it depends on who you're talking about. Uh, but I, I don't think that there, there is, an un, I, I don't think in general, I don't think, for example, Richard Dawkins accepts, to take a, one prominent example, accepts, accepts everything that's under the rubric of, of science. First of all, there, there's so many things that under the, uh, the rubric of science that aren't science. I think, in fact, what a lot of atheists say is we have to be looking for the difference between science and pseudoscience. However, that there are, I mean, I, th I think that, that, that atheists who are good scientists are the first to say that there are disagreements in science. For example, Sam Harris, uh, who is that, uh, that bird like William James, who's trained both as a philosopher and as a neuroscientist, uh, if you read his blog, you've been reading a lot of the things he's been writing about uh, uh, people not having free will. Well, I, I've, had, I've had discussions with him. I don't know whether the fact that you and you and you and you and me and you, that we are all sitting here tonight, that we did not, that it was not an act of free will, that it's determined by millions of years of all kinds of things that, that have happened. And I told Sam, I don't care really. Uh, now that is not that is not a scientific statement, um, but I don't think that there. I, I think it will be extremely difficult for neuroscientists to quote prove that there is no such thing. 
literally from a philosophical standpoint, you can no more prove that there isn't such a thing as free will by, say, Pavlovian experiments than you can, you can prove that there, that there is no God by the fact that bad things happen, you know, to use a kind of loose analogy. But I, I do know one thing, that as a humanist as well as an atheist, if it's true, if Sam is right, and if, if someday there's some, but there won't be, of course, because no one will ever agree on it, if there's some set of experiments that could, could prove that there's no free will, it really doesn't matter whether, whether there is or there isn't. Because in all of our institutions in society, we have to act as if there is free will or we can't move anywhere. So uh, in, a, in a way, I think it doesn't matter. That's not a scientific statement. But it, it's perhaps a statement about the limits of science, although I do, I do think, and I don't think this is scientism, I think that many of the questions science can't answer, which religious people say, oh, science can't answer this, science can't answer that. I think many of those things that we still call mysteries are capable of being answered by science. I just doubt that free will is, is one of them. But I, I, I take your point. I just, don't, I just don't see as much worship of science in the people I know who care the most for science among atheists. I, 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 I well, what I was that. referring to, I guess, specifically was not necessarily the, the, the people that write the books as much as sort of a general feeling. For instance, you, you mentioned um, issues okay. with, with some atheists who think that women are, women are stupid and so on, so on and so forth. There's a lot of research in the last few years on the neurobiology of gender differences. And I see a lot of people that just take anything that comes out of that, that literature on board because, you know, there is an fMRI scan, so it must be true. Well, <laughs> well, look, well, look, as you know, we've also had a lot of research showing how people pick out of research those things which always accord with their own biases. It's, it's, very, it's, very, hard, it's very hard to get away, to get away from that. In fact, in fact Ingersoll said that how, how really convenient it is for people to think that their wives are intellectually inferior to them because then they can justify having their wives be servants and it's all very pleasant for the men. Yeah, absolutely. Now, going back to Ingersoll, you had an interesting relationship with, uh, with Walt Whitman, right? Um, so he, he wrote... They met kind of late in, in both their lives. Yeah, so he, he wrote a, a wonderful eulogy of Whitman when he died. But Whitman, however, was very religious, and he was very critical of Ingersoll on that, on that um, level, right? So can, can you elaborate a little bit about the relationship between the two? Uh, why, why do you say Whitman was very religious? Um, well, for one thing, because I found uh, quotes by him to, to, to that effect, I don't have them with me, unfortunately. Oh, but he wasn't religious in any, in any, stand in any conventional right. no, orthodox sense at all. No. Ingersoll had a lot of friends who were religious in the way that, that Whitman was religious. I would say that religion, that religion for Whitman, Whitman, in my view, was far more resembled that of deism and, okay. and, and if anything the religion of nature and, and what Ingersoll you know said at his funeral was is that he had been condemned because because what he said took from nature his beliefs. I, I think I think that, that Whitman Whitman did believe in a sort of natural providence or something like that, but I, I guess I objected to your calling him religious because that implies to me a more. In but that they, context. But yes. they didn't agree that there, Ingersoll, Ingersoll really didn't believe that there was, you know, he believed in the randomness of things. He did, he was, he was a Darwinian in that, in that sense, that he did not believe that there was a guiding spirit for the universe and Whitman did, although his guiding spirit uh, was very different from the guiding spirits right. that most religious people did. They, they only met late in, late in both of their lives and, and became good friends. And when, when Whitman died, Ingersoll was off lecturing in Canada. Actually, he, he, was, he was out in Manitoba, I think. And, and Ingersoll, Ingersoll paid for a private railroad car to bring him back so he could give the eulogy at the funeral, which was widely reprinted, even though Whitman was still, you know, not, he was not a respectable literary figure at the time of his death. Yeah, that's so interesting. Well, what about the relationship between Ingersoll and leading religious authorities, actual religious authorities at the time? Well, the only relations with religious authorities he had, and they were close, were with people like Henry Ward Beecher, who was then the leading spokesman for liberal Protestantism. He had no relations with fundamentalist leaders at all. 
and who he really had no relationship with was Catholics. He really, not that he had, he, he didn't have any, he was just as, uh, rabbis disliked him every bit as much as fundamentalist Protestant ministers, but he thought Catholicism was worse simply because of its claim of papal infallibility. So he described the Catholic religion as even more irrational, if possible, than other religions because it actually believed that man was infallible. And he was, he was certainly, a, he was strongly opposed to and supported in every state the Blaine Amendments, which were designed, which still stand as a barrier in about 40 states to to religious aid, to, uh, to, uh, to, for public aid to religious schools. And they were motivated by anti-Catholicism at the time because at that time Protestants still controlled most cities and the Catholic school system was the first large parochial school system and what the Catholics wanted was the kind of arrangement they had in Germany in which both Protestant and Catholic schools got state aid. And uh, in Ingersoll, the Blaine Amendments were often motivated by anti-Catholicism, but not all of the people who supported them uh, did so because they were, they were anti-Catholic. But certainly anti-Catholicism played a role in their passage. And Ingersoll, Ingersoll did consider Catholicism worse than any other because it had this infallible guy at the head of things. One of the reviewers um, to, of the book um, somewhat critically suggested that, oh, here we go, the atheists need their, their heroes because they don't really have that many, and they paint uh, too much of a sort of pretty picture of somebody who was, after all, a human being, some master had his flaws and so on. Well, what, what, he what, did. What, yeah. uh, uh, he did. He did. He did, but, but not so many. I mean, like, if you ask me what Thomas Jefferson's flaws were, they're, oh, that's they're easy. obvious. I mean, uh, somebody like Ingersoll doesn't have any obvious flaw like that. Uh, you could consider it a flaw that he was a Republican who supported the gold standard. However, when you consider all of the things that, that, that say William Jennings Bryan, who was opposed to the gold standard, supported, I, I, I can't see that as a big thing. But he was rather different uh, from, from some of the titans of industry, like Andrew Carnegie, who was also a free thinker and who was a good friend of Ingersoll's in that Ingersoll believed in things like the eight-hour day, which a lot of his contemporaries who were businessmen in the free thought movement did not. Uh, he particularly, he believed in something which was really revolutionary, which is, is that women seamstresses should be paid the same thing as male blue-collar workers. Oh my. And this was, but this was really revolutionary at the time. And he said over and over, he said, he said, the, the shame of our cities, and this is, this is of course, decades before the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, which he didn't live to see. Uh, the, one of the shame of our cities is that women who are supporting their families work for this pittance of wages even more than men. And he said, furthermore, working men should consider working women their sisters. This kind of stuff was really revolutionary. And coming from a Republican, really bizarre. I have no doubt, by the way, that if Ingersoll had not died in 1899, he would have joined Teddy Roosevelt in the progressive movement. There's no, there's no question about it in terms of what his social views were at the time. And also something else that you can't say about bad about Ingersoll, which you can say about, about free thinkers as well as non-free thinkers in his party and in the Democratic Party, is Ingersoll, when in 1882, a Supreme Court decision, which isn't as well known as the later Plessy versus Ferguson, Ferguson, the 1882 Supreme Court decision basically said racial discrimination in public accommodations is fine, not rolled back until under Lyndon Johnson the Public Accommodations Act of 1964 was passed. Ingersoll is one of the few leaders in either party to speak out against this Supreme Court decision and say very presciently, as he did about, uh, about the connection between animal experiments and human experiments, that it would be an excuse for the Ku Klux Klan to practice every sort of violence against this race, which is not considered equal enough even to ride in the same train car with a white person. 
this was very prescient. Uh, he was he was a, he was a radical abolitionist. He became a radical abolitionist. Uh, he he was opposed to he was opposed to those in the Republican Party. Who basically, by the 1880s, said to the South, "You go your own way. You do what you do what you want." And this made him different from some other free thinkers as well. One of the things that happened in the free thought movement did involve women, which is which is almost all free thinkers had been abolitionists before the Civil War and were after, but the women suffragists were very bitter at the fact that men were given the right to vote while no women of either race were. And it made them, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Margaret Sanger, to name just two, they were racist, there's no doubt about it. There's no doubt about it. And people don't like to, to think of these things that are blots on free thought history, but they are there. Ingersoll wasn't tainted with that. So in looking for bad things to say about him, I can't find much. Oddly, one of the reasons it's difficult, the only bad thing you can say about him is if you're saying it from a religious standpoint, is he had so many friends, he was apparently so personally charming that the usual stuff you find, the nasty stuff about people's personal lives, which I would have drawn on if I could have found it, you couldn't find, because even people who hated his ideas, they liked the guy. Mm. I just heard, a, I just recently learned from uh, the, the managing editor of Slate, who wrote a long piece about a man who is known to history as the general who was defeated at Shiloh, the Union Blue Wallace, who wrote what became the best-selling biblical novel of the 19th century and is known to all of us in the form of the Hollywood movie Ben-Hur. Lou Wallace wrote Ben-Hur. After he ran into Ingersoll on a train, Ingersoll had also been at Shiloh, although they in general, Lou Wallace, didn't know each other. And after spending a train ride with Ingersoll, talking about Ben-Hur, Lou Wallace was inspired to write this book, which is a biblical novel and a Christian novel, but has the very unusual thing for then and now of having a Jew as the hero of a Christian novel, which apparently was part of the conversation. Ingersoll reminding him, you know, that all the Christians were Jews at the start. <laughs> yeah, well, one more thing about this idea of a, of a pantheon of, of uh, atheists or free, free thinkers. Who else would you put in there? You had a choice of another two or three names. Well, uh, oh, uh, Thomas Paine. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would put Servatius. I would put Pelagius, who was religious, but still, I think, uh, I think, I think, spotting the essential defect in the idea of this all-loving, all-powerful God who just sits <clears throat> back there because man has free will to do every horrible thing he can to his fellow man. I think that is a, a landmark thing in the history of of atheism. Uh, Hypatia certainly is a landmark figure in the history of atheism. Uh, also in the history of atheism, Ernestine Rose, who appears in Freethinkers, uh, a Jewish immigrant from Poland who, who spoke constantly about atheism, not about free thought, but about atheism in the 1840s. And she was both a Jew and a woman, which was really something. Uh, I'd say, uh, I'd say, uh, who else? Spinoza. Uh, Spinoza. Oh, we can have our, our crowdsourcing. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> yes, I, I'm not sure either Spinoza or Voltaire were atheists, but they're certainly in the free thought pantheon. They are there, and 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 we will see. You know, who are the heroes uh, who emerge from today? It's not as hard to be an athe atheist today, obviously. Uh, well, and, not, well, not here. Right, right, not, right. not 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 here. Now uh, let's put it right. a little this way also. There, there are heroes, not all of whose names I know in the Muslim world, uh, heroes who are still there, who are fighting for women's rights in places where, where ju just I think to be, some of them might say they're good Muslims, what else could they say? But I think, for example, people who are risking their lives for women's education in places like Afghanistan and Pakistan, they are heroes too, and I think someday we will find they are heroes of free thought as well as heroes of women's rights. Some of your writings, is what are some of other other uh, you know, colleagues, other writers in the free thought atheist movement, 
um, had been criticized for uh, buying into this sort of classical view of an antagonism between science and, and uh, religion. Um, a view that has been challenged by some historians of, 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 the, process, of, of the relationship between the two. Uh, for instance, Ronald, Ronald Numbers uh, uh, tends to take up the view that, right. no, actually this thing is very, way overblown. There is this much more complicated relationship between science and religion throughout the centuries, even revisiting classical instances, classical cases like the Galileo Fair and so on and so forth. What, what's, your, what's your take on that? Well, I think that any, I, I think the history of orthodox religion with relation to science can hardly be seen as anything but antagonistic. If we're going back to, if we're going back to Galileo and Copernicus, for example, the history of Catholic Church's relationship to science was one of finally, when they were finally forced to accept it, they did. I mean, yeah, you know, they just what, what did they just declare that you know, it, you know, it was it was wrong what they said about Galileo. Then, well, fine in the twenty first century. Uh, but to I say, should note, I should note that as parenthetical statement that the last pope, I think finally moved to um, pardon Galileo, but not Giordano Bruno. Yes. Not Giordano yes. Bruno, that's right. Uh, that's no, right. That, would, all, that, yeah. that would be going too, a too far. No. But look, obviously, obviously, to say that religion, that orthodox religion, almost all, all scientists, of course, had some religion, including in the classical era. What they had was a pagan religion. Uh, which was a religion. Uh, they, they didn't necessarily believe that there was no power in the universe, but they also, although, although their tools were limited, there is this march toward judging things on the basis of what you can see, and that is consistent in the history of science, even though with inadequate tools. Tools are so important. Without microscopes, you can't, and without telescopes, you can't know what's going on out there. Without microscopes, you can't know what's going on with bacteria. And these inventions are part of the search for truth. And certainly, I don't see how you can say that religion has been helpful to that. There have been periods where, uh, you know, during the convivencia in Spain, where certainly uh, Islam there in Andalusia was not antagonistic to science, and what Jews learned about science, they learned in cooperation uh, with with Arabs. But but the the Orthodox in every religion, there are different you know there are different forms of reconciliation. But to say that religion in general has ever been particularly helpful to science, the history of the relationship to religion and science is the history of religion religion resisting and then either accommodating or not accommodating according to how powerfully irrational the religious belief was. Yeah, I do that's what I that's my view. I tend to and, agree. And I'm willing to argue it with anybody yeah. who disagrees. I tend to agree. I think that the move often that some of these historians write like numbers, numbers is a very good um, uh, historian. Yes. But um, but some of the the move seems to be to go from, uh, to sort of debunk uh, the, the, the simple cartoonish version of, let's say, the Galileo story, show that it's more the reality was more complicated than that, which I'm sure it was, and then from there sort of lead to see, therefore, this whole thing about a, a conflict is overblown. Well, no, you just showed that the thing is more complicated. That doesn't mean that there was no conflict. Yeah, but there is, and, and, and there, can, there can be also there are some things on which certain kinds of faith just say no. I mean, we know, for instance, that it is possible to create life in a test tube, in a laboratory, and in planet moon. We know that in vitro fertilization, which didn't exist 50 years ago, is now a commonly used method of conceiving children. If your faith tells you that sexual intercourse is the only morally legitimate way to conceive a child, then of course you're going to have to be opposed to that kind of science. And I'm not saying that in a judgmental fashion. There are some beliefs that cannot accord with some forms of science. Um, one or two more questions, and then we open up to the, to the floor. And I want to go back to what has been perceived, even by some of the reviewers of the book, as somewhat of a critical attitude that you take towards some, at least, of the new atheists. Here to 
comment on it? Well, I, that was the last chapter, a, right. a, letter, a letter to the New Atheists. Right. The, the New Atheists, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm talking specifically about, about the, the ones who are most influential in writing. Uh, Dan Denna, Dawkins, Sam Harris, Christopher Hitchens, all of whom I greatly respect. But I think they have really left Ingersoll out of their pantheon. And I think, I, I think frankly, the reason for it is one, one reason I wrote this book, I don't think they know enough about him, uh, particularly the English. Why should they? Although Ingersoll did lecture in England, he doesn't appear in the, you know, in the standard English story of free thought, which, of course, consists mostly of Englishmen. He is an Englishman. Ingersoll wasn't. He was an American. Uh, but I think the very name, the great agnostic, means that a lot of what, what might be called the hard atheist, a term I don't use, but I've been called a soft atheist, uh, which I also reject. Um, but a lot of atheists, because Ingersoll was called the great agnostic, think he was one of those people who just said, I don't know, that, that he was one of those people who was trying to conceal his real views. And, and that's not true. And I don't think that he gets enough acknowledgement in kind of, the, like, like Christopher Hitchens, always, he was a great lover of Thomas Paine. And I got him, I persuaded him once to put Ingersoll in one of his speeches as somebody who helped revive his reputation. But, but I, think, I think it's partly the great agnostic, and it's partly just that Ingersoll's memory has been so lost that a lot of them, a lot of them don't know about him. Okay. They don't have that excuse anymore. Okay, my last question is, uh, you, you probably thought that I forgot about it, but it's about the golden age. Is it coming back? Are we hit now and we don't know? Uh, well, of course, uh, the, the golden ages are always things people look back <laughs> on. Right. Nobody yeah. ever thinks that they're in a golden age now. Yeah. But I think there is one problem, I think, and this is not a specifically secular problem, it is a specifically cultural problem. And that is that we know so less about religion today. Atheism and secularism were movements and thoughts and ideas and philosophies that evolved from people who had a deep knowledge of religious traditions and what they meant. I think I am not particularly encouraged by the rise of the so-called nuns because I think a lot of that, people who just say, oh, I don't, you know, I don't have any religion, comes from not being educated enough in religion to have views. You know, atheists, by a lot of people in their 20s, are considered every bit as antiquated as bishops and, uh, and, and conservative clerics and Jerry Falwell. Uh, and the Lubavitcher Hasidim and the Satmar Hasidim. So I think, I think one of the problems, ironically, for secularism today is a lack of knowledge of religion. And for those of you who haven't read it, I suggest you go to the Vanity Fair archives and read Christopher Hitchens' great essay written in the last year of his life on the King James Bible, which is right there online in their archives. And you can see how a thoughtful secular viewpoint necessarily requires more knowledge of religion than anybody gets today. And I think that is a problem, that people are uneducated not only in secular tradition, but in religion as well. Very good. Let's okay. extend our gratitude.